The talk is uh, causal data science. Has, has anyone uh, read my blog on Medium by the same title? A uh, couple, couple of folks, okay, cool. So it's, uh, some of the content might be familiar from that. Uh, if not, you can actually go there for a little bit more uh, detail on a lot of these things. Um, so I'll go ahead and, uh, and get started. <coughs> so I'll, I'll kind of go through what is causal inference and why, why you should care about it. Um, so this is something that you can do kind of in the setting of data analytics. Um, you can also apply it, as Tony pointed out in his talk, to machine learning problems uh, in a way that um, uh, corrects biases that are inherent in, uh, in obs observed, data, uh, observed data sets, so that is non-experimental data sets. So then I'll run through a little bit on how you do it with kind of a quick motivating example, which hopefully brings out some important aspects of, of doing causal inference, uh, and then say, um, given the upfront kind of cost, of uh, changing your analytics workflow, of uh, putting in the time investment to learn some fairly theoretical concepts to build up uh, the skills to do causal inference, uh, is it actually worth doing that? And when can you justify that extra cost? Cool, um, who here has done causal inference before in some, in some respect? Cool, okay, small handful of people. So hopefully a lot of this is, is new and worthwhile. Uh, so we'll kind of get, get right into it. So what, what do I mean by causal inference? Let's kind of start there. Um, so really, we're thinking of some, uh, some state, so some, some potential action you might take, and uh, the effect of that action on some outcome. Uh, so that could be the effect of exercise on a person's life expectancy, um, as measured in years, the effect of educational attainment on lifetime earnings, this is something you might study uh, in a more social science setting, uh, the effect of a change uh, in a product to some engagement metric, so this is something that would be very common in, uh, in data science or data analytics, uh, the, the effect of a policy action on stock markets, so this, this type of thing might be more common in finance. Um, so all of these are examples of causal inference. Um, what they all have in common is there's some notion of a causal state. So that's the, uh, the variable that is uh, defining your action. So this could be something like a binary variable if you're talking about a policy uh, action. It's we, we don't do it, so D is equal to zero, D being the causal state. Uh, or we do do it, so D is equal to one, or, uh, or true if you like, uh, that for the Boolean. Uh, so then once you've, once you've got a causal state, there's some outcome you care about. So this, uh, this will be some set of metrics potentially, but we'll kind of keep the focus narrow as one single metric. And uh, you could talk about the causal effect of the causal state on any, any collection of metrics if you like, but each of those is a separate inference problem for the, the purposes of this discussion. Um, so then there's some other set of variables you might care about. Uh, so these are covariates. They might reduce the noise in your estimation or they might have some more significant purpose which we'll talk about in a little bit. And finally there's the causal effect. So what is actually the difference in the outcome given the policy action? Um, so if I uh, implement some change to a product on my website, how much do I expect our engagement metrics to increase? Um, so what we mean there is, what's the difference between the outcome if I were to implement the policy from the outcome if I were not to implement the policy? So that's that difference, and it's exactly a difference, so to subtract one from the other, is, is something we'll talk about as the causal effect. Cool, so uh, just kind of to, to make this all more a little bit more concrete, I just listed a few of these things and uh, actually put little uh, numbers and stuff so you can kind of see that there. Um, so usually we'll set Z, or sorry, uh, D as the causal state. Um, the outcome will usually be Y, so that's the notation for that. Um, the uh, covariates will usually be Z uh, or S. So uh, these are some examples. Suppose we're making a product change, so the control state for an A-B test is uh, zero. The test, uh, test state is D equals to one. Um, we're worried about several outcome metrics on our website, so the time engaged on the website, number of engagements, and the rate of people re-engaging, so these are each outcomes we care about. And then in each of these cases, there's a causal, a causal effect we care about, so the average improvement in engagement time uh, between the test group and the control group, or the average improvement in engagement time, or sorry, number of engagements between the test and control group, or whatever other metrics you care about. Um, so we, we use A-B tests as the example because they're kind of the, the gold standard for doing causal inference. Um, but we can uh, ask the question, backing up a little bit, why do we, why do we need an experiment? Why can't we just uh, look at the data that we already have, which is how people are interacting with our products, uh, and, and say what the effect of a change in the product would be uh, from that data? So that's a, that's a question that's worth asking because uh, often we aren't able to run an experiment. 
so often we just have observational data. And this, this happens typically if uh, the policy change is irreversible, for example, um, like you're changing the way you structure a, uh, a product or the way you sell the product, um, or, if, uh, or if you don't control the system that you're uh, trying to assess the policy effects of, which is common in economics, social sciences, and in other settings. Cool. Uh, so let's look at why we run an experiment with a, a motivating example. Um, so D, our causal state, is whether a person on a website sees an advertisement. Uh, y is whether they buy an associated product. And Z is whether they're active on the internet. Uh, so there's uh, uh, circles drawn for each of these variables, and there are arrows pointing from cause to effect in each case. So we expect that the uh, ad has an effect on whether you'll buy a product. We expect your online activity has a, uh, an effect on whether you'll uh, see the advertisement. Um, it also has an effect on whether you'll buy the product. So people who are more active online are more likely to see ads. People who are more active online are more likely to purchase products online. Um, so that's the, uh, the basic setting. Uh, so what, what happens in this context? So if we, if we take more active users, we'll find both that they're more likely to see the ads, so those users actually do see the ad more often, uh, and they're also more likely to purchase products. And what we end up with is those two variables we, will be correlated even if there's no effect of seeing the ad on buying the products. So you can actually find that in settings where uh, the product will be completely unrelated to the ad that somebody saw, uh, but you'll still, still see uh, a large ad effect um, for, for those unrelated products. So that's a clear example where you have some spurious relationship between the variables. Um, there's actually a, a common um, uh, kind of methodology in native advertising where somebody will define their test group is uh, people who saw an advertisement. The control group is people who did not see the advertisement. Um, and then when they, uh, they, they run this sort of pseudo experiment because they, they are actually uh, running the ad on the site, they'll find gigantic ad effects with uh, something like thousands of percent bias. So we'll, we'll see some examples like that. Cool, so, uh, so this kind of leads us to the question, why should we care about these, um, about these biases? So one, one argument that you might hear, and I've heard this often, is, uh, well, we don't really need to go into the details and figure out how to deal with this problem. We expect that it's small compared to the effects that we're looking for, or at least our, uh, our, our measured effect should be directional for the true effect, where directional is kind of a vague and undefined term. Uh, so let's look at why exactly we should care about this type of thing. Um, so there's this nice paper that came out of Yahoo Research a, w a good while back um, where they took um, observational studies and compared them with the results of experiments that were run in the same setting. Um, so that's a great way to, uh, to figure out, okay, what would the bias be if we uh, looked at an observational study instead of uh, an experimental study? So how wrong would we get it uh, is, the kind of, is the question that, that they set out to answer. Um, so on the x-axis, uh, is the, uh, the day of exposure to an advertisement. The y-axis is an outcome metric that they care about, and they looked at these four different outcome metrics. Um, so they were showing advertisements uh, to people for um, visiting pages in the Yahoo network. Um, so they, s they have the probability of a, a visit within the Yahoo network, uh, a probability of a visit to yahoo.com, uh, a probability of a visit to uh, Yahoo Mail, and a probability of, uh, or sorry, and then just the number of page views uh, within the Yahoo network. So if you look at this, it looks like on the day of exposure, there's this huge effect, right? So there's this giant spike, uh, and you, you would say, okay, looking at this data, it looks like the ads are really effective. But notice uh, there's this kind of first clue that something's going wrong, which is the zero point here, the day of exposure, uh, is, uh, has some ramp up before it. So that it looks like there's this kind of a causal effect um, where somebody is more likely to visit a page within the Yahoo network uh, before actually seeing the advertisement. So, uh, so what exactly is going on there? That's weird, right? <laughs> so th this is this problem of activity bias, at least as argued by the, uh, the authors of this paper. So what the, the issue here is, uh, is that you're more likely to visit a page within the Yahoo network today if you visited the Yahoo network yesterday. And so there's this correlation in time uh, with your online activity. And so this activity uh, bias is what you're seeing with these spikes. Um, so what you actually have here is the blue curve is the test group and the red curve is the control group. Um, so this is actually uh, a comparison against a, a randomized trial. 
And so you can see there's a spike in the control group as well as the test group. And, and, and it's, again, this due to this uh, activity um, issue. Um, if you look at the difference in uh, probability to visit on the day of the advertisement, um, you can see it's the difference between these peaks here. Uh, and you can try to follow it as it, as it falls off afterwards. Uh, but you should see no statistically significant difference before, uh, before exposure to the advertisement. Um, and so this study found uh, no statistically significant difference in the outcome metrics due to exposure to the ad, even though there's this gigantic bias for, uh, for what you would expect uh, from an observational study. <coughs> um, so if you were to estimate the search, search lift, just to put this in numbers, uh, you would find uh, uh, over a thousand percent improvement uh, from, this, uh, from this advertisement, just from the observational study, um, where the true effect, uh, this is actually in, a, in an adjacent study, a slightly different one, uh, but same, uh, same context, uh, was 5.4%. Uh, so just taking the ratios of those two, that's 2,000% bias. Uh, that was actually observed in a, a real advertising setting. <coughs> cool, any questions at this point? This is probably a good time to, to pause. Yeah? Okay, cool. Um, so, so the, the answer to why you should care about it um, at, uh, so far is because the, the biases aren't small. Um, if, uh, we'll, we'll get into a little bit more detail on, on kind of the uh, tolerable limits of bias in just a little bit. So when in general does this happen? We looked at one particular context where there is this uh, common cause between um, the causal state and the outcome. So we had uh, people being active online makes you more likely to see the advertisement. Uh, being active online makes you more likely to see um, uh, uh, other pages in the Yahoo network or to purchase a product online. <coughs> um, so it's this common cause kind of uh, concept um, which is driving this spurious association between the causal state and the outcome. Uh, so in general, there are lots of different things that could be common causes of uh, the causal state the, or the treatment and the outcome, the, the effect of the uh, causal state. So you could have, uh, in a web context, generally there are attributes of the user that might cause both. Uh, so the ac user activity was an example that we looked at just a second ago. Uh, attributes of the context, so they could have heard maybe uh, from somewhere else that they should get online today for some reason, so that could drive this kind of uh, activity-based confounding. Uh, and then there's attributes of the context that could also affect both of these things. Um, so these are just a few different categories that are, that are useful to think about in a web context because it's kind of a nice way to, to split up the world, but you could come up with other categories as well. Um, so what, I, what I'm arguing here is that this is actually a very general problem and it's not just a feature of that specific context we looked at a second ago. Um, a, f a, few, uh, a few years ago, I was seeing tons of blog articles that looked something like this. Uh, they were, uh, you know, extolling the virtues of uh, uh, data analytics for business intelligence, um, and they were putting up plots that looked just like this one. Um, so here I want to emphasize that the causal state doesn't have to be a binary variable, um, policy or not policy. It could actually be a continuous variable as well. Um, so here we have the number of words in the headline of an article. Uh, versus the click-through rate for the article, or the, the number of times, or the, sorry, the proportion of times when the article is shown that it gets clicked on. So the question the authors were looking at, and I'm not citing the, the blog post intentionally because I don't like to, to point out people uh, specifically uh, for, for this kind of behavior, is uh, uh, what they're looking at is what's the optimal number of words in a title, and from this plot, you might infer that it's uh, somewhere around 16 to 18 words in the title um, gives you the peak in the, uh, the click-through rate. Uh, but the problem here is they're assuming a certain model of the world where the headline length directly affects the, uh, the click-through rate, but they're ignoring common causes between the two. Um, so just to kind of think of some, uh, and it's pretty, pretty easy to think of things as an exercise in these different contexts. Uh, so just to think of one, you might think uh, maybe a, um, a very good author prefers uh, certain length headlines, um, but also because they're a very good author, uh, they also write very click, uh, clicky headlines. So it's headlines that people will want to click on, so people view their articles a lot more. Um, so just who the author is could confound the headline length and the, uh, the click-through rate. So maybe we just have one author who's particularly successful, who also prefers uh, 16 to 18 uh, word headlines. So the, that's, that's one example of, uh, of a confounder that could cause the, 
uh, the relationship you're seeing there where there's this spike at 16 to 18 words. Um, so generally the world is complicated. There are lots of different causes of, uh, of any particular variable you care about. Um, when, you're, when you're making a policy intervention, it's a little bit less uh, because you have control uh, over, uh, for example, the, the headline length. If you were able to control it, then you could do something like an experiment or an A-B test. Uh, but generally, if you have observational data, you don't have that luxury, and you kind of have to worry about everything else in the world um, driving extra uh, correlation between the variables that you care about. So this is why we run experiments, and uh, this is uh, the generality of this problem is, uh, is something that makes it uh, something you have to worry about in general when you're in an observational context. <coughs> um, cool, so let me just check what, yep. Cool, any, any questions so far? It's probably another good pausing point. Yep, sure. So, I mean, maybe you'll we'll get to this, but with everything else in the world, that's a pretty broad universe of possible common kind of variables. So that's right. You to narrow it down. That's right, yeah, so if, uh, the, the key to narrowing it down is, is we're talking about causes of the, the causal state and causes of the outcome. So that gives you a, a kind of foothold to start looking at what variables do I actually care about for this. Uh, so that's, that's one way to start narrowing it down. Cool. Um, so uh, so when, when generally should you care about this? Um, so there, there are really two sources of bias if you kind of break down the world. Um, so we, we argued that there's bias due to this uh, spurious relationship introduced by common causes. Um, and that bias actually falls into two categories and only two categories. You can actually show this uh, with, with some algebra. Um, <coughs> so the first type of, uh, of thing I'll, I'll just explain with an example and then kind of show the, the more theoretical version is what if people who get the treatment or, or see the ad were already more likely to click on it? Um, so that's, uh, <coughs> or, uh, or, or we're already more likely to purchase the product. So that's, that's something that might happen if, uh, if, uh, if the user is very active. Um, so the people who are seeing the ad uh, because they're active online are also more likely to, to click the product. There's a second type of bias that can happen, which is uh, the people who <coughs> are more likely to see the ad for the product were also the people who the ad is more effective on. Uh, so it's a difference in the effect of seeing the advertisement. So there's, uh, if you wanted to kind of abstract that a little bit um, to think about it across different contexts, what we're really talking about is there's a baseline difference in the outcome. So the people who saw the advertisement were more likely to buy the product whether or not they saw the advertisement. Um, and then there's a difference in the effect of the treatment. So the, the, the effectiveness of the ad in this context. Um, you could think of this also in a medical context with the effect of a, a medicine. Um, so just to, um, uh, yep, so this, this stuff matters in general when these two things are possible. Um, so this is a way to think about it in a different context than with common causes, but instead in, in, in the context of uh, potential outcomes. Um, cool. Any, uh, any questions on that before I move on? Cool. Okay, great. Uh, so that brings us to the question, okay, we care about this. Um, the biases can be large if we don't do something about it. Um, so how do you actually do something about it? Um, just to kind of make a, um, a precise point on the size of the bias, if you're talking about a binary policy outcome, you really just care if the, uh, the causal effect is positive or negative. So really you just care if implementing the policy would have a positive effect or whether it would have a ne negative effect. And so the question there is how much bias can you tolerate and still get the correct sign? And the answer is 100% bias. So you can get anything less than 100% bias and the sign doesn't flip. Um, so if, if you can find a, a causal inference method uh, that gives you better than 100% um, bias, then you're, you're in good shape. Cool, so okay. So how do you actually do this type of bias adjustment? Uh, so let's look at what an experiment actually does, and that'll give us some intuition for, uh, for methods that we can use to correct for bias. Uh, so what an experiment does is it takes this observational system on the left here, where we have no control over who sees the advertisement just because it's running on the site in an, in an uncontrolled way, and it says we're actually going to control whether or not people see the advertisement. So we'll decide beforehand that uh, if, if some people with odd numbered user IDs come to the site, they get to see the advertisement. If it's even numbered, they don't. User IDs are randomly assigned, so that gives us random assignment. So we'll just kind of take this very simple uh, type of experiment. 
And what that does is it removes Z as a cause for the causal state. So it's no longer driven by user activity. They would see it um, if they're active enough uh, and not otherwise. Uh, and so we, we've got this type of control over the system. Um, and so we've, we've got D independent of, of Z. So let's, let's get a little bit more rigorous about this so we can kind of build this up uh, a little bit more precisely. And that's going to lead, lead us to some quantitative methods we can use to do this kind of bias removal. So we have our binary causal state, and this is what our, uh, our data matrix looks like. We have our uh, outcome variable Y over here. So these might be number of page views during a week or something uh, similar. Uh, and then we have uh, these two other variables, which I'll define now. Uh, so these two other variables are called potential outcome variables. Y1 is the outcome that uh, would happen if the person had been assigned to the D equals to one state. And y0 is the outcome that would be if the person was assigned to the d equals to zero state. So you can see you only measure one of these at a time because the person can only be in one state. Um, and so that, that actually presents a, a specific problem. Um, what, that, what, that's, what that says is we can never actually measure a difference between y1 and y0 for any individual. And so we can never actually see the causal effect that we care about, which is the difference in the outcome uh, from one state to the other. Uh, so this is a problem both in experiments and in, um, and in observational settings. Uh, so what we end up doing is say, let's, let's use the expectation here, uh, this expected difference, uh, and let's use the linearity of that to say, it's actually the expected difference in Y1 and the expected difference in Y0, and let's see if we can actually get somewhere with that. Uh, so we don't measure Y1 and Y0 directly, Instead, we just measure the outcome, y. And it happens to be y1 if d equals to 1, and it's y0 when d equals to 0. Um, so what we've actually measured isn't the expected or isn't y1 overall units, which would let us get that average at the top there, or y0 overall units, which would let us get the average on the right-hand side. Um, but what we've got is uh, just y given d equals to 1 and y given d equals to 0. Um, so what we need to do to actually get this average at the top that we care about is look at the, um, uh, sorry, is make this assumption that y1 and y0 are independent of d, which makes us free to condition on d. That is free to look at subsets of the population. Um, so what we assume then is that people in the uh, y equals, uh, sorry, d equals to one state for whom we measure y1 are representative of the whole population's y1 values. So an average within the, the, the treatment group is the same average we would measure if the tr control units had been in the, the treatment group. Um, so that's the assumption that we're making. And because of randomization, uh, that is random assignment, we make sure D is actually independent of everything. And so we do get this uh, independence of D from the potential outcome variables. Uh, is, are there any questions here uh, at this point? This is kind of the, the, uh, the core um, problem in causal inference. The, uh, uh, this problem of not being able to observe Y1 and Y0 simultaneously is called the fundamental problem of causal inference, and this is the, uh, the solution to it. It's, uh, it's this assumption of uh, un unconfoundedness. Cool. Any questions? Okay, great. Um, so in an observational study, we generally don't have that type of independence, so we can actually look for something a little bit weaker called conditional independence. So it's not that Y1 and Y0 are independent of D, it's that they're independent of D within some specific context. So uh, in the case of um, this user activity example, we can say, okay, what if, what if we, we don't assume that D and Z are independent of each other or that Y and Z are independent of each other? Um, what if instead we assume um, that if you fix Z, uh, you remove this, uh, this spurious uh, dependence? So remember, D, uh, D is, is more likely, so people are more likely to see the ad when Z is higher, so the person is more active. They're more likely to buy the product when the person is more active, and that variation in these um, variables is what drives this uh, spurious relationship or this, this biased ad effect. Um, so what you could have instead is say, let's fix uh, the value of Z, so only look at a, a subpopulation with one specific value of Z. So we remove that source of the covariation between D and Y. And within that population, we have an unbiased effect. Uh, so that's, that's kind of the core of the trick here. It's, uh, this is called conditional independence. So Y1 and Y0 are independent to D conditional on Z, or that is within uh, subpopulations where Z is held constant. So let's look at a, a trick we can, uh, we can do to make this work. 
So let's uh, first generate some data for a simulated A-B test. Um, so what we've got is uh, we'll have D be our, uh, D right here be our uh, treatment assignment. So it's going to be one or zero uh, with a 50-50 probability. And then Y is the outcome. So it's uh, a random normal plus uh, uh, our effect size delta if they're in the D equals to one state, uh, but this term is zero if they're in the D equals to zero state. Um, so what we have is people in, uh, uh, people in the uh, D equals zero state just get a random normal variable, so the average is zero. If they're in the D equals one state, they get a random normal plus, uh, plus one, or sorry, plus uh, 0.5. Um, so the average is, is 0.5 for those outcomes. Cool. Um, so we can actually estimate that with a regression. And so if we just use D being binary and find the average value of Y at D, uh, then we get uh, this coefficient on D, which if you look at the confidence intervals, agrees with our causal effect of 0.5. Um, so we have our regression estimator for the, uh, the causal effect. Um, notice the R squared doesn't have to be good for this to work. The better your R squared is, the, the more precisely you're going to end up estimating D. So it makes sense to add extra covariates if you can account for some of the noise, um, but you don't have to. So why, why exactly did this work? Um, if you look at our regression specification, it was delta times, so some coefficient times D, uh, and that's, that's, uh, that's what our model for Y is, plus some noise term. So if you take the, um, the uh, value you fit for delta, that should be the average of the causal effect. And if you actually look at the data generating process, you can see that uh, right here. So taking the difference between these, uh, you just find delta as the, uh, the result. Cool, so let's add a common cause between D and Y. So it's gonna be a very similar data gener generating process, but we're gonna end up adding this extra bias to it. So we'll add Z as our common cause. So this could be uh, the, the user is very active or the user was online today, so some proxy for activity. Uh, we have D is a, uh, again, binomial variable, but this time the probability depends on Z. So it's going to uh, be 0.75 if the person is active, so much more likely, uh, or 0.5 if the person is not very active. Uh, we need it to be a common cause with Y, so Y also has to depend on Z. Uh, so we're, we're going to make it depend on Z in this kind of funny way. So we're going to have the, uh, the advertisement be more effective if the user is uh, is more active. So that's our, our model for it, where the coefficient on, uh, on delta is this uh, z-dependent uh, piece here. Cool, so let's, uh, let's see what effect this has if we just kind of do the regression as we did before. So if we uh, look at the um, average, uh, uh, if, we, if we look at the actual causal effect, I've set this up in kind of a funny way, but it turns out that the coefficient on D is actually the same value as it was before. So we still have the same uh, causal effect, uh, 0.5, which is what we're looking for. Um, but if we run this regression, um, now we have this bias. So a bias, so a regression estimates this um, 0.7 effect, with, uh, which is statistically significantly different from uh, uh, the 0.5 effect, if you look at the uh, uh, confidence intervals. Cool, so uh, the, the, the solution I mentioned before where you just kind of hold Z fixed is, is the approach that we're gonna take here. So let's, uh, let's hold Z fixed. So we're gonna switch uh, the data frame to Z equals to one uh, units only and then regress only on those people. Uh, so what we find here is still the, not the effect we're looking for, um, but from the arguments we made earlier, this should be the effect within a subpopulation, right? So this is the effect within the Z equals to one subpopulation. And hopefully we can use this to recover the, the average causal effect. So then if we go to the z equals to zero group, uh, we find an effect of minus 0.5. So this, uh, this is the wrong sign from what we had before, uh, but maybe we can use these two together uh, now that we've measured the causal effect in every subpopulation to get the ca causal effect averaged over the whole population. Um, so as you might guess, the solution is to take a weighted average between the effects. Uh, so if we take the 1.5 we found earlier and the minus 0.5 we found uh, and average them together, we end up with 0.5, which is the correct answer. Um, so there's an interesting uh, consequence of this, uh, this analysis, which is that uh, this is a posit positive average effect, which is, which is great. So this might uh, say we should probably implement this policy, but you also have to care about the fact that within a subpopulation you had a negative effect. 
So if you're talking about making a change to a website, uh, then you're actually gonna, you're gonna hurt the experience of about half of the population if you were to implement this, even though it's a positive change overall. Um, so that's worth, uh, uh, worth noticing. Cool, any, any questions at this point? Am I doing on time? Cool, perfect. Uh, so okay, so this worked because we knew what to control for. Um, we didn't have to control for too many variables, so we could actually split them up into two different groups. If it were a thousand groups, we wouldn't have enough data points to do that kind of splitting. Um, we had enough data to, uh, to stratify and perform two separate regressions. Um, so this is not a statistically efficient approach because we're, we're using two separate models, each fit on some subset of the data, and there, there are better ways that you can tackle the problem. Uh, but this is a good one just to, to illustrate that this kind of stratification works. Cool. Other, there are a, a ton of other approaches, and there's a huge literature on this subject. Um, a good book for this is Morgan and Winship's Counterfactuals and Causal Inference. Um, that's a very applied book. Uh, Mostly Harmless Econometrics is a great one. It's a little bit denser, um, but it's, uh, it covers the methods well. Um, and there, other approaches are, are better in different contexts. If you have a lot more variables, um, if you don't have a lot of data, if you have unknown variables that you need to control for, uh, then there are other methods that work well. Cool. Um, so that's, this is kind of just a, a list of things that you can Google later if you'd like to, uh, to find things, uh, find, find other approaches that can work. Uh, but kind of the, the key takeaway here is if you really want to do this well, there's a ton of stuff you need to know how to do. And every approach has different caveats. And uh, the caveats aren't something that you can just know from, uh, from looking at the data, uh, unfortunately. So you really actually have to understand the system well enough to know whether each method is justified, which means you actually need to understand the methods really well to know whether its assumptions are satisfied. Um, so what that means is there's a significant um, uh, learning overhead to actually picking up these methods and being able to use them effectively. Um, which, is, which is a problem if you're looking at kind of a practical um, analytics context, which is how do you even hire the people who can do this stuff? Uh, so that's, uh, that's, a, that's not, a, not an insignificant problem. So uh, part of the solution to that, I started writing a package called Causality. Um, so you can uh, play with this uh, in Python. Um, the goal there is to make causal inference easy so that uh, you don't have to have as deep a knowledge of it to do it correctly and to do it uh, safely. And by safely, I mean making sure the assumptions uh, for the, the different algorithms are satisfied. Um, so here's a quick example I'll just run through. Um, this is the uh, propensity score matching method. It's another conditioning-based method that doesn't require stratifying the data explicitly. Um, so here we'll have three different confounding variables, which are causing uh, D, the, um, the causal state. And there's the outcome, which is also dependent on these confounding variables. Uh, so we can just drop all this into a data frame X here at the bottom. If you look at the naive effect, just the difference between the obs observational treatment and observational control groups, what you find is a 0.36 effect. If you compare it with the true effect, just by differencing the potential outcomes, which we know because we, we generated the data ourselves, um, you find the true effect is actually zero. Cool, so if you just drop this data into the propensity score matcher, um, you tell it which is the causal state, D, which is the outcome, Y, and which are the uh, covariates, Z, um, and whether they're continuous or discrete, so it knows how to, how to handle them, um, it'll give you the correct uh, average treatment effect. So it just makes it pretty quick and easy. Um, so it sort of just works, trademark. Uh, if, <laughs> if you're smart though, you won't stop there because there are assumptions that the, the algorithm has to satisfy. Um, or rather, the, uh, the system has to satisfy. Um, those assumptions in the context of uh, propensity score matching, and this is actually true in a lot of different contexts, is that the, uh, the Z variables have to have um, the same domain for each causal state. So in the D equals to zero state, uh, the Z variables have to have the same domain, and likewise for the, uh, uh, the D equals to one state. Cool, so you can actually check that. Um, there are a couple of methods for, for doing that. Just to put that assumption explicitly, it's that uh, uh, this probability has to be positive for all values of the inputs. Um, and you can just kind of drop some plots out to, uh, to check that visually, um, at least in 1D. So there's this uh, check support method that just generates these plots for you. 
Um, you can also see how well you did at balancing on the Z's, which is a, another kind of technical point of propensity score matching. Uh, so there's the kind of is it worth it question. Um, because the biases are so big, you really need to do this if you're working with observational data. Um, but the time investment makes it difficult. Um, so my argument is if we develop the right tool set that does automated assumption checking, um, then it, it should be uh, low enough investment and require low enough expertise um, that it should be practical in a, in a realistic context. Cool. Just to show one more example, um, here's an uh, uh, addition to the pandas data frame object called zplot. So instead of just plotting, you say zplot. It takes exactly the same methods and it'll give you a causal plot instead of a, a correlative plot. Um, so if you look at the causal plot here, for the same data, it reverses sign um, versus the regular old plot method. Um, so this is called Simpson's paradox, where you get this sign reversal between the different policies. Um, so you can uh, do this as e easily as your normal exploratory data analysis workflow. Um, so this uh, uh, should, should kind of fit seamlessly into the, the usual data scientist or analyst toolkit. Cool. Um, so just kind of the last slide, we're, we're hiring for my team at Barclays. So if you'd like to join, uh, join me at work and learn some of this stuff in, uh, in the real world, then uh, uh, just let me know. My email's right there. Um, you could also search for the job posting online. Cool. Thank, that's, uh, that's it. So thanks.